few years back, I had to go to the United States for uh, to spend a year there. And when I got there, somebody gave me a bow and some arrows. And so I decided, boy, I wanted to, to take up archery as a sport that I think I would like. And so I started to uh, practice and practice that year that I was there, practiced quite a bit. But my aim didn't get very much, uh, didn't improve very much my time there. Then I had to come back to Spain for five years. And then I went back again to the United States, got there, there's the same bow. And so I picked it up and I decided with more determination, I'm going to get good at this sport. I'm going to become the next Robin Hood. And so I started to practice and practice uh, as much as I could. And that whole year, my aim didn't hardly improve at all. I could only hit the bullseye maybe once out of six times, not too good. And I came back to Spain, spent five years here. And then uh, just about a year ago or so, I went back to there. When I got back, there was the same bow. Now, it dawned on me, if I practice and practice, but don't get any better, well, maybe the problem's with the bow and not with me. And sure enough, that was the problem. That, that bow had a permanent flaw from the factory. And so it didn't shoot straight, didn't shoot the same place uh, twice in a row. So I had to get a, a different bow, bought a good quality bow, and my aim improved greatly in, in, very, in a very little while. But the thing is, you know, if you have an instrument and you practice and practice and don't get any better, what do you get? Well, you usually get frustrated and discouraged and say, man, this isn't my sport. I can't do this. I'm just going to give up. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it, but, uh, you know, a lot of people, when, a lot of Christians, when it comes to evangelism, feel the same way. They want to be good at it. They want to hit the bullseye, so to speak. And they try and try, and they just never can seem to hit the bullseye. And because of that, they end up getting frustrated and back away from it. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it or not, but maybe the problem's not so much with you. Because a lot of Christians think, well, I don't have this grace to evangelize. That's... God hasn't called me to do that. But maybe it's not, the problem's not so much in you. Maybe it's in the instrument or the tool that you're using. Just like in my situation, my problem with archery wasn't so much that I was bad at it as, as the instrument, the bow I had, was flawed. And have you ever thought maybe that God has given us an instrument that we can use uh, an instrument that's not flawed, that we can use in evangelism, so when we witness to somebody, we can hit the bullseye. Well, that's what I want to talk about today, this instrument that God has given us, so that when we witness to somebody, we can hit the bullseye. The, uh, the verse I like to use as our foundational verse comes out of Galatians 3.24. This is the NIV version of the Bible. It says, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. I like how that version says that. It says the law was put in charge. Now, we know in the place that where you work or, uh, you know, there's somebody in charge there. A lot of times you might go into a mechanic shop and say, hey, who's in charge here? Now, now if we don't like who's in charge, let's say at the place where we work, we can't just flippantly change it. You know, you try to put somebody else in charge. Well, they'll show you the door, you know. But uh, in here in this version, in Galatians 3.24, it talks about God himself has put the law in charge to lead us to Christ. So who are we to change what God has put in charge? You might say, oh man, you know, asking, you know, using the law and asking people if they've broken the Ten Commandments, you know, if they've sinned, and that's kind of personal. People might get offended. You know, instead of that, I'm just going to tell people about how much God loves them, how much Jesus loves them, and how He can help them in their life. The thing is, you know, you can't find in the Bible where it talks about the love of God being put in charge to lead us to Christ. I think the, the verse is very clear. It says, God himself has put the law in charge to lead us to Christ. So who are we to change what God has put in charge? So when we witness, we need to ask ourselves, when I witness, have that chance to witness to somebody, is the law in charge? Are the Ten Commandments in charge of my conversation in the sense, 
Is it leading that conversation to where I want it to go? And uh, now if God, who knows everything, has put the law in charge, there must be some good reasons for it. And what I want to do today is just talk about four reasons why God has put the law in charge. Probably the, the first reason is probably the most important. The law has been put in charge because the law shows us our sin. We see this clearly in, Rome, in many places, but Romans 3.20 says the knowledge of sin comes through the law. In Romans 7.13 talks about so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. The thing is, if we don't see sin as utterly sinful, we're not going to repent from it. We'll just justify it. Oh, it's not that bad. Everybody does it. And the thing is, without repentance, there's no forgiveness of sin. And that's, that's, you know, that's one of the hardest things for Christians to understand. Because they've all, we've usually just hear half the gospel. Just believe, in, just believe in Jesus Christ that he died for your sin. Ask him to come into your life because God loves you. And you'll have eternal life and you go to heaven you know, after you die. But the thing is, when we only preach half the gospel, you end up having a lot of believers in Jesus Christ that haven't been born again. Because Christ won't enter into a heart that hasn't repented from their sin. When we see that how Jesus preached and how Paul preached, Peter preached, it was always repent and believe. They always go together because without repentance, there's no salvation. As Jesus Christ will not go into a heart that hasn't repented. And for somebody to repent, we need to use the law. The law brings the knowledge of sin. What we do is hold the laws out there. Bring them out there, give some examples of how people break the law, some of the commandments, but we let the Holy Spirit be the one to convict of sin. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit's job when he comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness as seen in God's laws, and the coming judgment. We don't try to convict somebody of sin. That's not our job. We can't see sin as utterly sinful, so how are we going to make somebody else see sin that way? God is the only one that sees sin as utterly sinful. And the only way that we can really see it that way is when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Convict means to convince. He helps us see sin as utterly sinful so that hopefully we'll repent and move away from it. And that's what happens when we, when we use the law. We always need to remember that without repentance, there's no forgiveness of sin. And the law really prepares the way, under this conviction of sin that the Holy Spirit brings as we use the law, prepares the way for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The second point I want to talk about, that God has put the law in charge because the law leads us to Christ. Now let's say that we're over here, as most people are, in the sense that, you know, they might not be perfect, but man, I'm not that bad, I should go to hell for, for eternity. Now the law has this responsibility to take us from over here, thinking we're good enough, to over there where Christ is over on the other side. Well, how's it going to do that? Well, let's just look at a couple laws. And you talk with somebody, you say, well, how about this law? You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, I've never you know, robbed a bank or anything like that. Well, it means really any type of stealing. Have you ever taken coins from your mother's purse or candy from one of your brothers or sisters? Well, yeah, I, I've, of course I've done that. Well, then on the day of judgment, when God judges you by his law, will you be innocent or guilty of stealing? Well, I'd be guilty. Well, how about this law? It says, uh, you shall not lie. Have you ever lied before? Well, yeah, of course, but, you know, they're just white lies. Well, were they lies? Yeah. Well, when God judges you then on the day of judgment, will you be innocent or guilty of lying? Well, I'll be guilty. Well, how about this law that says you shall not commit adultery? Now, oh, no, no, I've never done that. I'm single. Well, this law, do not commit adultery, really encompasses any type of sex outside of marriage. Sex before you ha get married, or even mental sex, looking at a woman or a guy, saying, man, I'd like to go to bed with her. Because God judges not only what we do, he judges how we are on the inside also. Oh, man, then I'd be guilty for sure. So what the law does to move us to where Christ is, it destroys all of our hope and our confidence in ourselves as good people. That's what it does. The law shows us our sin under this anointing of the Holy Spirit. Makes sin utterly sinful. We say, you know, 
My confidence and my trust in myself has just been destroyed. Now I'm without hope. And at that moment, Christ would come in, if you want to look at it this way, into the courtroom and say, God, wait a minute, I'll pay for Kevin's sins, I'll take his place so he doesn't have to go to hell and can go to heaven. Now all my trust that was in myself before that's been destroyed, now I've put it in Christ. And uh, he is a transfer, really, of trust from myself in the Christ, into Jesus Christ and what he's done for me on the cross. That's how the, uh, the Holy Spirit, through the use of the law, draws us or leads us to Christ. Because the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, he convicts of righteousness through the laws of God and the coming judgment. And so under this conviction of sin, we know judgment's coming. And now we start to look for a way out. We don't have any trust, any hope in ourselves anymore as good people. So we start to look for another way. Now I said earlier when we just started that the love of God has never been put in charge to lead us to Christ. You know, that saying sounds pretty hard, maybe a little bit coarse, but when we look at it in the Bible, what we see that the law leads us to Christ, or if you want to look at it this way, the law leads us to the love of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus on the cross. That's how the Bible shows us how, how the law works. You know, if you just go up to somebody and say, you know, God loves you, Jesus loves you, you know, wants to make your life better, bring you to heaven afterwards, most people think, well, of course he does. Why shouldn't he? You know, I'm not that bad. And plus, you know, that's God's job to love people. But, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that God's love for us and, uh, and when we see it, especially in the New Testament, God's love is always connected with something else, something tangible. You know, God's love for us doesn't depend on whether we feel it or not. And in the New Testament, we see that God's love is always connected with the cross. You see, who, where Paul says, who loved me and died for me. In Revelation 1, we see that who loved us and rescued us from our sins by his blood. And so God tells us he loves us, not because we're great people, but he tells us his love for us, and he shows us that in a tangible way in the cross of Christ, how Christ died for it voluntarily, died for our sins, taking our place. Well, if that's how God tells us he loves us, it's probably the best way for us to tell other people that God loves them. Because when somebody comes under conviction of sin, they know their, their hope in, their, in themselves has been destroyed, not only that, they see judgment day is coming. They know it's going to happen. There's no hope for them. And then they see Christ come in and say, you know, I'll pay for Kevin's sins. Boy, I understand the love of God perfectly. And it's, and it's probably the best way for us to tell other people that God loves them. The love of God is very important when you're witnessing, but Paul really says it almost more has to do with the Christian. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul tells us that the love of Christ compels us to, to witness to others. Because when we're witnessing, we're using the law to witness, but our motive behind it has to be this love of Christ. The love of Christ in us has to be compelling us to preach. Because if you use the law without love, you're not going to like it very much. And you'll be harsh, harsh and uh, self-righteous. But through the love of God, through this compassion for the lost, the law finds its place and works perfectly. And the law leads us to Christ. The third area I want to talk about, the reason that the God has put the law in charge to lead us to Christ, is because God commands all people, all men everywhere, to repent. We see that in Acts 17.30. Now, my type of evangelism before, my typical type of evangelism that when I was shooting, kind of shooting all over the place and never could seem to hit the, uh, the bullseye, sounded something like this. You know, God's got a wonderful plan for your life. You can have a personal relationship God through, through Jesus, with God through Jesus Christ. He's going to fill up this emptiness that you have. He's going to make you feel fulfilled in life, and you'll go to heaven after. Why don't you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and change your life? There's a couple main things wrong, real important things wrong with that type of preaching or witnessing. Probably the first thing, that type of witnessing has nothing to do with repentance. 
If you want a better life, accept Jesus. You feel unfulfilled? Well, accept Jesus. And we always have to remember, without repentance, there's no forgiveness of sin. And when your message just basically has to deal with how God can make your life better, and it doesn't use the law so they see their need to repent, uh, they'll maybe, take, maybe ask Jesus to come into their life to try it out, see if it really works. But the problem is, he won't come into their life. They'll just be believers in the sense, uh, but that haven't been born again. And another reason that type of uh, witnessing isn't biblical is because God doesn't command all men everywhere to feel fulfilled. But he does command all men everywhere to repent. And when we use the law, we can witness to anybody because all men and all women are guilty of breaking God's laws. And that's, what's really, uh, that's what Christianity is really all about. And we see in Acts 17, now Paul had spent a, a good number of months with the Ephesians, and he's going to wrap up his teachings now with the Ephesians. And he says, I haven't withheld of anything a benefit from you in my teachings. Now he's going to wrap this up. He's going to summarize all this, all his teachings for all these months, maybe about two years, and he wraps it up this way. I haven't withheld anything of benefit from you about repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. That is the, the basis, if you will, the foundation of Christianity. Repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. doesn't have a lot to do with a lot of other things. We need to repent towards God because we've broken His commands and, and we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ as the one who paid for our sins. And the only one who paid for our sins, therefore he's the only one that can forgive us. Well, we're talking about how God commands all men everywhere to repent. And see, when you use the law, you can witness to anybody because everybody's guilty of breaking the laws. In 2 Peter 3.9, we see it says that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. A lot of times we read these verses, we think, oh, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's always both repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. The last area we want to talk about, the law has been put in charge uh, because the law has been written on our heart. We see that in Romans 2.15. The requirements of the law are written on their heart. Now, if God who knows everything, has written his laws on every single heart of every single person in the world, it should be a clue to us that God wants us to use it. And when you use the law, <clears throat> really, you can, the law's in charge of your evangelism. You can witness to anybody if you aim for the heart. And that's what we do in evangelism. We're out there, and uh, what we want to do is aim for the heart. And how you aim for the heart is through the use of the law. Think about it for me with a second. For a second. The law of God is written on our heart. Doesn't matter if you've ever heard about God or not. The law of God is written on our heart. It's in our heart where we're convicted of sin. And it's with our heart that we believe on the salvation. It really all happens here in our heart. And so when we're evangelists, we always have to keep that in mind. We're always aiming for the heart. And we do that through the use of the law. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings this conviction that hopefully will turn this person away from their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ. What's one of the wonderful things about the use of the law is when you use the law, you don't have to be intimidated by anybody if you aim for the heart. Now, if you aim for their intellect, you need to be intimidated because it's very frustrating. You usually go around and around in circles. You can't seem to hit the bullseye. Con conviction of sin hardly ever happens because we're usually not using the law when we're aiming at the intellect. And, uh, and plus, another frustrating thing about aiming for the intellect, there's a lot of people out, out there that are smarter than you are, whether you believe it or not, but there are. But aim for the heart. When you aim for the heart, you don't need to be intimidated by anybody. As under this conviction of sin, you'll see something happens. In, in Romans 3.19, it says that the law shuts every mouth and holds all men responsible or guilty before God. And that actually happens. See, when somebody comes under the conviction of sin, all their arguments just 
fall away. They have no more importance. Now the person knows they're guilty and that the day of judgment's coming. The only thing that matters to them, is there any way out? Is there any hope for me? And this is the power of the law. And so when you use the law, you don't need to be intimidated. So you don't need to be the Bible answer man. But you do have to let the law be in charge of that conversation, guiding you and leading you. Because God's not out so much to convince the people of his existence or so many other things. We saw very clearly in John 16, 8, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to minister to the unbeliever in these three ways. Convict of sin, of righteousness as seen in God's laws, and the coming judgment. That's what he does. Our job is to put the law out there and watch him work. Brings this conviction of sin. Usually their arguments will stop, shuts all their mouths, their head might drop, they might get real nervous. Uh, but it's just preparing the way, really, for the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. I think a lot of people don't understand the use of the law because they haven't seen this power of the Holy Spirit making sin utterly sinful. Let me just give you one example real very quickly. I was witnessing down on the street this lady. She's probably about 35. She's walking by and so we just said, you know, stopped her and just said, hey, we're asking people their opinion. You got a couple minutes? Want to give your opinion? And we found out probably about 95% of the people you ask if they want to give their opinion are glad to give it. And she says, yeah, what's it have to do with? Well, we're asking people that after, when after we die, will a lot of people go to heaven or only a few people? And she said, oh, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any of that stuff. I said, well, that doesn't matter. Let's just pretend for a moment that God does exist because it could be true. You know, he might be out there somewhere. She said, okay, let's just pretend. Just pretending God exists. Uh, I think, she said, I think uh, many people would go to heaven. Well, why is that? She gave her reasons. Well, how about you? Let's call her Maria. How about you, Maria? You think you'd be one of those many people that will go to heaven? She says, oh, I'm pretty sure it, no, I will be. No, I'm positive I would be one of those people. And why is that? So she starts giving her reasons how she's a good person. Well, Maria, I'm in agreement with what you have to say. Not everybody's going to heaven. So if not everybody's going to heaven, it must mean God's going to judge who gets in and who who doesn't get in. Now for God to be just with everybody in the world, he'd have to judge us all by the same laws. Maria, have you ever heard about God's laws before? Oh, they'd be the Ten Commandments, she says. I said, that's right. Have you obeyed those? She says, I've obeyed all of them. So well, let's just take a look at a couple of them very quickly. How about this law, Maria, that says, you shall not lie. Have you ever told a lie before? Well, yeah, maybe just white lies. Well, Medea, on the day of judgment, will you be innocent or guilty of lying? She said, well, I'd be guilty. Well, how about this law, Medea? You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, I did steal a, a, a shirt but from a store, but it, was, it wasn't very expensive, and it was a long time ago. Well, you know, time doesn't forgive sins, doesn't cover over our sins, Medea. When God judges you on that day of judgment by that law, you shall not steal. Will you be innocent or guilty of stealing? Why well, be guilty? And just that fast, those two laws, she starts getting all nervous. And she says, man, I can't take this anymore. This is too heavy. This is too heavy. I got to go. I got to go. And I said, well, let me just ask you one other question, Maria. How about this law which says, you shall not commit adultery? Now, she's about 35, and she gets all happy and says, Oh, oh I've, I've kept that commandment. I'm single. Well, Medea, it really encompasses any type of sex outside of marriage, even sex before you get married, even mental sex. Even that? Even that? And I said, Well, then would you be innocent or guilty? She says, Oh, I'd be guilty. I'd be guilty. And she almost starts walking around in circles. I can't take this anymore. I can't take this. This is too heavy. This is too heavy. I have to go. And she's about ready to leave. And, and uh, she, was, she was just really undone. I said, well, Maria, let me ask you one other question before you leave. Maria, on the day of judgment, where will the guilty go? Ah! She screams out loud in the middle of the street. I tell you this story just to encourage you, never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit to make sin utterly sinful and to convict of the day of judgment. That's what he does. We can't understand how he can do that. 
You know, because people hear the Ten Commandments all the time and they know that it doesn't seem, doesn't seem to bother them that they're breaking them. Well, that's because the Holy Spirit hasn't come and made sin utterly sinful to them and convicted them of that day of judgment. But as you talk to them and hold out the laws of God, give examples of how we break them, you'll watch the Holy Spirit move and He'll do that because that's, that's what He does. Our job is to give Him something to work with. Now, you know, when I started, I talked about this bow that I had that I couldn't seem to hit the bullseye ever. But when you use the law, you're aiming for the heart, you'll see you'll hit the bullseye the majority of the times. You know, that, that bow that I had was flawed. It had a defect in it, never didn't shoot straight. But it says about the law of God in Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect. It's not flawed. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful verse. Well, we've been seeing how that God has put the law in charge because the law leads us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So what happens when somebody comes under the conviction of sin, because you're putting the laws out there, giving examples how we break it, never tell anybody they're guilty. Always ask them, let it come out of their own mouth if they're innocent or guilty. And, uh, and that really is preparing the way for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you have to remember something about, uh, about the use of the law or about evangelism. If you think evangelism is just about winning souls, you're going to be discouraged. You know, the, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, he talks about evangelism this way. He says, sometimes we sow seed, sometimes we water, and sometimes we reap. And I've come to learn when my job out there is to always be sowing good seed. And I do that when the law is in charge. Because God has put the law in charge. So I can't change that. I've got to so use the law with love and a good heart, you know, with compassion for people. But uh, and every time I use the law, I know I'm sowing good seed. If I get to reap, praise God. But sometimes you sow seed. And as Jesus said about the farmer, he went out and sowed the seed. Then he went home, went to bed, and then he said the seed grew, and he didn't know how. And, you know, that's a very encouraging verse. Sow the seed, and it's God's the one that makes it grow. He germinates it. We can't do that. And sow good seed, and every time you do, you'll know, you'll know that you're doing a good work. I encourage you to try to, to use it. Use the law, and you'll see aim for the heart. Let the law be in charge, directing your conversation. And you'll see the power of the Holy Spirit bring conviction on people. And I'll tell you, it'll set you on fire. Evangelism can be effective and simple when the law's in charge. <laughs>